Good day, good morning, and welcome to the, um, I hope it's not the drier part. Law is always treated with a little bit of um, resistance. As I appear in the room, I know <laughs> what's the reaction immediately, but let's try and make this as interesting and relevant this morning. Um, so in the 20 years of practice in business, I am aware of the significance of preventative legal measures, which is risk mitigation, as opposed to um, looking at uh, curative or remediation purposes of law. What I'm saying is don't sue <laughs> and don't try and recover losses at the tail end of business activities, but start considering intentionally where we are moving um, in our business so that we can prevent losses. And this is the whole framework and the basis of um, governance, risk, and um, compliance from a risk mitigation perspective. So the concept of, um, the, the we are in a stage of distrust, and um, as mentioned by Greg, is that we, we it is the unknown at this stage. And I think the unknown will continue <laughs> because it, it has a way of changing and evolving. So the threat is, is there, with threat to the economy, it's threat to society and directly to our households and our, our personal beings. Um, but I think more relevant to today is the, the risk of the external risk of, and the um, of the of the technology into our business. And then dealing with this in a systemized, standardized approach is probably gonna give us a better chance of ensuring that we are dealing with potential losses that will arise in a more organized fashion. So the idea of GRC is the cumulative or the interdependence approach towards governance, which is the character protection and building of the business, as you're aware, and I'm sure you agree, that integrity of your business is perhaps more valuable, the cash in and outflow. Um, and uh, uh, secondly, that it's about determining uh, and responding to potential risks that will and is 100% assured to be arising in your business. And finally, is using compliance not only as a um, a sounding board or a, uh, a checklist, but actually using it to your advantage because it's regulatory compliance offers great standardized um, approach and treatment to risk mitigation. So in general, the traditional approach to risk mitigation within business starts off with acquiring knowledge, which is not here. Perhaps you know or don't know about what you don't know, but once you know what you don't know, you're able to go and get that information and um, then start you know, moving within your business in an intentional manner. So knowledge, yes. And secondly, is determine the existing status quo um, and the uh, future status of your business and what risk would look like within as the business changes and moves within different phases of growth, uh, different phases of expansion or um, any form of, um, of movement, as I say, change in the business cycle. So a very, very, a, a way that is generally used and acceptable is to develop a way, a framework of controls. And we're gonna hear about this as we speak about AI. Controls is a system of management of tools of where we look at our, our behaviors, our systems, our processes, and our documentation. And in this obviously would be now our digital documentation, our digital systems, and what we are utilizing in the business in terms of how relevant, how efficient, and what controls we have in place, as you say, with the eye being on potential threats. So in terms of AI and the use of any form of technology, this GRC framework takes on a the look and feel of when we look talking about tools, we're not just talking about operational systems, we're talking about the technology that's introduced to enhance and improve efficiencies around our operational systems. When we're looking at HR and compliance or occupational health and safety or health and safety measurements, what is it in these processes that are being digitized and um, that requires a closer look in terms of evaluation and validation on an ongoing basis? And the human elements, as we introduce technology, particularly with its artificial intelligence, is what are the dependencies and how reliance and how are we weakening in terms of our job uh, dispositions and our functionalities. And therefore we are keeping an eye on say tools, the processes and other humans that are completely and should be having full oversight 
over this um, this environment. Well, we're a little bit panicked. We're a little bit concerned. We're trying to control this, and rightfully so. We have reasons for fearing um, in artificial intelligence, mostly because it is an unknown because of the complexities of the, the human and the technology and the input and the machine learning um, uh, uh, capabilities, uh, the lack of transparency of what is learning and how it's been learning, the, the source of the data, the source of the input, the good and bad actors into the input, and very important as to how that's impacting society. Uh, and society is not just govern, government, um, uh, executive uh, uh, the executive team at national level it's not just ceos and um highly uh, sophisticated and learned and uh, humans they're also our children and the vulnerable that are directly impacted um, and our workforce that are not trained and equipped so therefore we start looking at taking considering the safety risks what are the rights of such persons how do we enforce this in talking about the law and how we criminalize it and criminalization is coming and how we deal with uncertainty in the form of uh, compliance and controlling this in from a regulatory environment. The best way for humans to respond to threat is to police and enforce. In order to do so, it requires law. So we cannot run away from uh, the impending um, uh, legislation that is going to arrive uh, in, in very, very soon. So in terms of risk to the business, everything that exists in terms of risk has now been, um, it, it's been intensified because AI has the ability to learn faster and they're not just the good stuff, it's learning the threats. And therefore it's delivering threats in a quicker and a faster and a more significant manner. So when we were traditionally looking at cybersecurity in the form of, let's say, um, an external, um, uh, a, a human that was trying to uncover a password and get access. Now, if this was the AI intelligence that was using imposing this threat of trying to break a code and and then be, and gain access to the server, the potential of that loss or risk is it's you cannot even measure how much higher it is. But so cybersecurity threats and the data privacy securities that have been in place, such as GDPR and in, in some instances, protection of personal information or um, electronic communications, electronic uh, uh, transactions, the digital eco economy, digital uh, environment, online trading, all of that online where information was being shared, the threat of that has become seriously a lot stronger. The underlying uh, biasness and unfairness as a result of the source of data, the machine learning capacity, learning, as I say, from wrong influences, and the ability to use that information to influence humans in decision making, such as, um, let's say, voting, or um, where to purchase from, and uh, or uh, uh, safety. That becomes a serious question in terms of discrimination and biases. With regulatory compliance, the risk to business is what do we comply with? Where do we even start? And what is the cost of this? Client contracts, and I'm seeing this more and more often, and you must be acutely aware of this, is that in almost every document you are signed, there's a requirement that require there's a requirement that you may either have to limit liability for use of AI disclose the use of AI, what to what extent it is being uh, uh, disclosed, and to indemnify any supplier, customer, or third party that you are contracting with, that if in the event you are using AI, that you have the necessary um, frameworks in place to protect them and that counterparty uh, indemnification and protective mechanisms. And chances are we are using AI, I, we, you know, we're about to discover that a lot of us are already relying on it, but what are we doing to protect other third parties that we are transacting with uh, in terms of protecting those, um, those uh, individuals and entities? Of course, over time, we find that this is going to have an impact as to how we operate from a human element, the costs and the technical challenges around this and plagiarism in a digital environment where information is so freely available, we are still holding on to intellectual property. And that is 
Ah, it's a cornerstone of business. What we own, it's a real right in law. It's highly defendable and protected. So how do we ensure that the source of AI information is not, um, it, it, there isn't any uh, concerns around plagiarism uh, in terms of what information we're using, but also in terms of how we of how we protect our business. A lack of transparency in terms of what we are doing in business and how we are transacting. We are probably in that muddle right now. We're in a very great area where we are already in AI, but we are not taking sufficient steps and measures to protect ourselves and our stakeholders in the business. And this is already starting to pose a serious risk. And I'll tell you what happened with social media and the law. It was very exciting. It was wildfire. Social media, everyone started to get online. And we started to communicate. It was very exciting. We started to upload pictures. We were sharing. And then the court started to fill up. The cases started to trickle in because there is no law regulating um, online so conduct on any form of media. But the discrimination, the slander, the misuse of information, the breach of intellectual property, the damages that were cost to third parties, even if it was a simple case of a custody battle and, and uh, a, a divorce, we only started seeing the repercussion and losses when we, started to, when we started to go to court and answer questions. And then businesses started to suffer uh, severe financial losses. So in terms of governance, risk, and compliance treatment methods of AI, if we stick to the very fundamental framework, and it's a very smart framework, because you'll see that it's actually utilized in some of our most current uh, e, um, AI legislations. So the fundamental of, first of all, knowledge is to acquire, and when we're in a state of doubt and fear and confusion, we need to clear that, that, that up by speaking to specialists to learning from and learning from global best practices and trends. And then we go back and we, we kind of, we need to do some data validation. We need to look at what software is underwritten, if I may use that word, by AI, where the back systems uh, are in fact impacted by outside influence. We have to know what we are relying on. And then we've got to find ways to scope that and treat it. And this is treatment. Now, it, all comes down to management. The human element decides how I'm going to control the risks of AI. It is not the AI who is going to report to you and say, well, look, we've got a potential breach here, or we are looking at potential bias here. Can you please do something about this? This falls squarely within the, uh, the responsibility of directors, shareholders, executive teams, um, management, all persons that are controlling the strategy and the direction and the value and the characteristics of the business. So these control measures will require control documentation, so such as guidelines, searching and seeking for best international compliance guidelines if there's none in your immediate economy and within Africa, as we are in, a, in that state. I cannot believe what must be going on with the South African government right now. Do they go and amend the Poppy Act, the Paya Act, the Paja Act, the Constitution, the um, every single leg legislation, the Electronic Transfer of Communications Act, or are we going to look at one overarching legislation that's going to change everything about the way we function? And uh, there must be absolute chaos around that. So what we need to do is get best practice, learn from the specialists, get some plans in place, know what is impacting us, and create some really strong over, uh, human oversights with our cybersecurity controls. Talking about the regulatory environments and um, currently in Africa, there's a very little activity in, the, uh, in terms of uh, measuring uh, AI reliance. Um, now the, the red dots here, it does not, there is activity in Africa obviously, because we're here and uh, we are, a, you know, a, thriving uh, economy uh, in totality, what they have done is look for the most dominant. So it's not reflective to say that in this particular um, uh, uh, spreadsheet, but I, I'm sorry, this um, this particular sheet. Uh, what I wanted, the point here is there's, pro there's probably, uh, predominantly more activity in other um, areas in the world. And also as a result of that, they have been at the forefront of developing regula regulation. 
So the US, for example, this morning I was reading, they've got about 15 different legislation that is in the process of development, everything from algorithm controls to labeling controls to deep fake controls. So it's uh, apart from the overarching compliance of the standard, as in the EU AI, economies are now drilling into the specifics around risks that they have identified. So what is, I mean, what do we do? We're here in Africa, we've got uh, GDPR from the from EU, uh, we've got OPI, and we've got various other uh, 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 legislation within our economies. The best we can do is now just to look at these global trackers and see which is the most dominant, which works perfectly, not perfectly, which can be utilized and adapted within our current environment. So we, for this morning, for today, we're going to look at the EU AI Act. And the reason for this is because it is the most overarching and most complete and encompassing legislation in place. It was passed in Ju July 2013, and there's still a lot of resistance around this, surrounding this. Uh, May, uh, July 2023, sorry. <laughs> there's a lot of resistance around this, as you were, in terms of EU. There's a lot of economies having to agree. But the biggest concern is it's going to um, impact competition and business activity and the commercial side of the commercial aspects of having um, a robust AI within business environments. E, the EU AI legislation is also at the forefront because it's got a really great categorization and risk scoping um, element to it, which is absence, absent in a lot of the other le legislation. So what it does is it asks you to scan your environment and it gives you guidelines on the types of AI that can be classified from extremely high risk to low risk or no risk. And once you're able to categorize this, you are then able to treat it in a way that is uh, required as by law. And if it, if you don't treat it in the requirement by law, then there's a repercussion. There's no criminalization of it as yet. And there's no policing of it as yet, but it will be over the next two years. Alternatively, as the leaders the um, and the, and the, 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 the uh, directors and the executives of a business or of the economy, you would have to set up your your, uh, uh, your own control mechanisms and governance frameworks for the lower risk um, type of AI systems. So from the European Commission, I screen grabbed this page and I um, and I, I think it's an excellent way for us to have a look at and, and to acknowledge that first of all, our fears, uh, are justified, but they're only justified to the very top of that very high pyramid. So the most prohibited, unacceptable risks uh, that have been identified by the EU Commission is, is small. It's a very small percentage compared to the total use or the universe of AI systems that are being implemented and utilized. So that gives us some kind of relief. So um, at the very top, we've got the unacceptable risk, which is now prohibited or banned in terms of the EU AI legislation. And then uh, thereafter, uh, the controls in place from medium, a minimal or a higher risk, which would either be in the form of compliance with the legislation or following guidelines, which you would have to implement internally. So best practices for you. A quick closer look at the prohibited systems or unacceptable risks. In terms of the EU AI Act, these types of AI systems would be banned and would should not be utilized within the jurisdiction of the economies that have that are complying with this legislation. So any form of stimulation uh, that is uh, manipulating a human, a human's thought process, which may cause them psychological or physical harm. Um, an example of this may be the use of certain artificial intelligence systems in the work environment, such as the playing of music or the playing of certain sounds or um, creating certain vibrations or, um, and manipulating the environment, which may cause, may en encourage a higher output, such as higher energy, uh, you may not fall asleep, you may be highly stimulated, but if you're exposed to that for a higher period of time, 
then you could in fact harm yourself in the form of exhaustion and falling asleep while operating in a, um, a dangerous piece of equipment, such as a driver having to drive for extended hours. In addition to that, this manipulation may be extended to vulnerable groups, such persons who have the inability to uh, distinguish between what, you know, if they were faced with these things, whether they would like a child uh, with a lower mental capacity or a grown up or an adult with the same sort of lower mental capacity. Um, an example would be toys that are uh, developed by AI and there are certain components of it that may encourage extended use of programs or the use of certain vocabulary. Uh, you know, this is extremely scary as to how you how you actually um, manage that from a human, <laughs> from a consumer perspective. And if there is any sort of system where uh, there is an inability to evaluate and determine source of data, where there is a lack of um, account uh, uh, transparency or where the system is used for biometric identification, uh, social scoring, which is now determining facial uh, recognition for um, uh, uh, police enforcement um, and, and for identification, which is now breach of um, breach of uh, such uh, personal information rights and fundamental rights. These are then considered unacceptable risks. These are considered prohibited use of AI systems and are banned. And the uh, repercussions of that uh, yet we don't know, but it may be criminalization in the form of fines or uh, imprisonment. Um, the medium to high to low risks are probably less onerous. Um, here we are looking at the use of any information that is where it, it where has, has been influenced and the source of that information is AI. Uh, an example of a medium risk is within the medical industry, consumers using um, medical equipment um, such as determining heart rate, high pressure, uh, the uh, and then relying on movements um, as a result of limited movement where AI may is part of that particular process or, um, or system. Um, and then uh, these, the best way to deal with this is for you to have your own controls. Uh, so uh, labeling is very important, disclosure uh, 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 and in informing the users the use of AI has been um, uh, we ha has been incorporated in the uh, in the production of this particular product or service. Your voluntary requirements, and this is where governance is squarely on your shoulders to say that it is not prohibited, but it is impacting the way humans um, are receiving this information. You would have to create your own codes of conduct, your own guidelines, create your own transparency disclosures to notify that you are now using uh, you are exposed to deep fake uh, content or that you are using information that has been generated by the use of AI. All right, um, so an excellent standard that was released, um, it was released uh, and finalized earlier this year, as most of these are, is in terms of ISO. And I know we, we use ISO as an excellent practice here within most environments as a uh, standard of, of implementing a framework. And it, this has already received a lot of uh, acknowledgement and in, internationally in that it is based on risk management. It is based on a risk uh, uh, identification and scoping process. And overall, it's an un, it's all encompassing ecosystem for, um, for managing and uh, deploying and using AI in the way that could give your business a lot more comfort and reassurance. And this would require the including inclusion of uh, knowing your software, knowing what's being used, what systems and what people are in your business are using, to trying to develop and control the trustworthiness of this, which is your human uh, side of your human inputs. And of course, your constant evaluation, whether it is data validation or whether it is the system's evaluation for its accuracy, for its cleanness, <laughs> if I may say, and that we were able to rely on that. Um, and then a little bit more on ISO. I would recommend that if you are considering a GRC framework that it is supported 
by uh, an ISO or an ERM system that could actually help you implement it um, operationally. And finally, from my side, to say that if you are concerned about governance, governance is about you intervening, getting the knowledge, knowing what's out there, developing your own codes of conduct, sharing this information and training and creating awareness within your team and within your immediate circle of influence, always ensuring oversight that works with a robust cybersecurity system. Uh, you, one cannot uh, work without the other. And then you must create a life cycle system, which is end to end on the deployment, the onboarding, the continued use, the monitoring, the measuring, and then if we had to terminate and, and, and how we would actually do that. Where to start, as I've mentioned uh, um, previously, is the first is that we are here right now in exactly the right place where you need to be is to acquire this knowledge. Number two is to now scan the environment to determine what is happening in the world, but also what is happening within my immediate workspace, my, uh, my family, my community, uh, my economy, uh, where are we exposed to AI and how is it benefiting us, but where do the risks lie? Scoping and treating risks would be the controls you would put in place from a human oversight as well as from a cybersecurity perspective. And as you know, with any risk management system, if you do not monitor, evaluate and revise, then you are in fact in a very redundant um, risk management system. And that brings me to the end of my contribution.